All right, guys. This is the Variety okay. Show, season three, episode four. We're here with Pat Master Lotto, all the way from Austin, Texas. You may remember him from such 80s bands as uh, Mr. Mister, a one time drummer in XTC, and also a longest serving drummer for King Crimson. Hello, and how are you? Uh, I'm okay. Good morning. It's hot uh, in Texas. I've already been up for quite a while. It's 10 o'clock in the morning here, so I got up around 6 to mow the yard, do some other things while it was still cool enough. So, And now here we are. Yes, at last. I have all my vinyls here, all my necessary related vinyls and CDs, so I'll be able to bring those up. Hopefully bring out some memories from a bygone era of music. Okay. Stir it up. Yes. So uh, where do we begin with your story within drumming? Take us back to those early days, if you remember anything at all. Early days of Of your drumming, Uh, sir. Where did you start? (laughs) Uh, I started, I was about 10 years old, and I'd already been trying to play uh, guitar because the British invasion had come to America. So this was in the uh, mid-60s. Uh, Ringo was a big influence Uh, but to be honest I was trying to play a French horn at the at the summer camp and the teacher it was the teacher he said I need drummers and he looked at me and he says you've got big hands you go back to the drums so he assigned that to me and uh and and I and I was happy so I stayed there that's nice you mentioned in an interview you had a fascination with the sounds of nick mason in the source of all secrets drum solo and that kind of fascinated yourself with the electronic sound was it just that or was it pink floyd overall uh no it, it, well i love pink floyd overall but uh in particular i'm a gumma. Uh, you know, there was a lot of psychedelics at my age in those days. So I spent a lot of time with Pink Floyd, a lot of very intimate time with Pink Floyd. And uh, that track used to blow my mind. And as I started to learn more about recording, I realized, I think kind of what he did was he orchestrated on the console and was was muting and, and like he'd play sustains on cymbals or drums and then take turns unmuting them at the desk. That That's how it sounded to me. So I was, I, I've always been, uh, I love music probably more than I love the drums. <laughs> so this whole, this whole music thing is what got me. The drums was just a way to find my way into it. Uh, there was certainly a long time where I thought I might become an engineer. I wasn't sure if, if my playing was was strong enough. So uh, I've always been fascinated by studio gimmickry. Yeah, you could have turned out to be like Alan Parsons and produced a whole bunch of albums. Well, possibly, but I doubt it because I don't think that's in my personality. Uh, as I started to get a lot of offers to produce people, I realized I am not that happy as a producer because I don't like to have to make the final decision and I don't like to tell people what to do. I don't like to to critique people's music, fans, whatever people come up, Hey, listen to my cassette. Tell me what you think. I don't want to tell you what you think, (laughs) what I think. It's just another opinion. I I got no more information, no more revelations than anybody else. So go ask your mom what she thinks. Uh, (laughs) It's just as pertinent. Mm. I am. Um, I myself. I'm self-taught, so I'm also a drummer myself. Believe it or not. Wow. Yes. Of um. High five. High five. Mine are right here too. That's how I start yes. my mornings. I didn't tell you that. I spent about a half hour paradiddling out on the porch as yes. I drink my coffee, and uh, yeah, I'm up in my little studio now. So. Mm. See, so, yeah, I okay. was influenced mainly by Rush. So I'm very on the technical prog side, sir, where when we get into King Crimson, we'll probably delve uh, more into that, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, uh, I probably shouldn't say this on, on live radio, but I'm not that big of a Rush fan. That was a band that never really, they didn't really hook me. Uh, so. That's fair enough. Rush isn't for everyone. Yeah. yeah, yeah, man. I mean, I mean, such a legendary drummer, but I really never listened very much to Rush. I, I kind of avoided them. <laughs> there was even a time for instance the police the police were so popular and it seemed like everybody was trying to play like Stuart copeland uh so i avoided them i didn't buy any after the first record i never bought another police record i couldn't avoid them you'd hear them on the radio but i didn't want to listen to that in my house or in my studio mm. 
So another point I like to bring up is moving to Los okay. Angeles and uh meeting, you know, Kenny Loggins and doing stuff with him, and that would sort of, you know, guide the way into the nineteen eighties with Mister Mister. Uh, no, that's the wrong order, actually. Uh, really? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I met Rich and Slug first, uh, the Misters, uh, Mr. Mr. Bam. That band was already Pages. They were already formed. Oh, yeah, right. I was pages. auditioning for, I was auditioning for Pages. And then quickly we, we realized this was something different. The manager and the, everybody realized this was different. We gave it a, a band name. Uh, and, uh, uh, somewhere in that process, we did a lot of songwriting. Rich and Slug very dedicated and john lang uh writing every day so the band would get together you know several times a week at rich's house or at a place in the beach that he might rent and we just try to get ideas going and generate new songs but also he was simultaneously uh like working a lot with jay graden so he would know that al Jarreau needed a song so he might write one on the side specifically for Al Jarreau. In fact, as I remember, Kyrie Alay song was actually a song for Al Jarreau. And then uh, Rich gave me a demo and he said, what do you think about this for the band? Maybe you can make a new, uh, have, have a look at it. And when I listened to it, it was sort of a samba, a fast samba. And I said, oh man, this thing could be slow and fucking Zeppelin and that, mm. I, I feel this rich i think i got an idea anyway so i did a lot of sessions that were songs that richard wrote or co-wrote so i didn't i i never met daryl hall i played on the hall and oats record because rich wrote the song i played on the track uh, uh so likewise with kenny loggins uh i think i had two interactions with kenny uh well the first session i did was a song richard wrote that we did at uh foster david foster david foster's house in malibu so he, richard lives in malibu so it's nearest place and we went over there one afternoon and recorded i think it was called one woman one woman uh i'm not sure the record might have been called avalon but i never met kenny and then a few years later uh uh, he was doing another record that my friend Paul Fox was producing. That's what it was. Paul Fox was producing and they'd already finished the record, but Kenny wasn't happy. So they were recutting and re overdubbing as well as cutting a few new tracks. So that's, that's the times that I was actually in the sessions with Kenny uh, were when we did, I forget what that was called. It was a big song with a lot of Jim Bay. And it was me and Luis Conte, a whole lot of people in the studio, uh, yeah, late night, long. I was like a twenty-four hour, never leave the room kind of session. <laughs> wow! On a weekend, I, I remember. Wow. I remember it was a weekend. Yeah. <sighs> Actually, and then all all the tapes got stolen. Oh. This is a very long story you don't need. But uh, when they picked up the equipment from the studio in Westlake in L.A. to drive it back where Kenny lives in Santa Barbara to continue working at his studio, the truck uh, was broken into and stolen, and they lost the master tapes uh, they lost a rented digital 24 track machine they lost acoustic guitars everything was in that truck yeah wow Jeez pretty fucking Christ. amazing yeah oh yeah. my god and and i know this because paul fox the producer is my friend he had a date booked the following week with gus dudgeon and the royal philharmonics or whatever to do overdubs now he doesn't have the tracks oh so he has to go he goes and finds a demo of the then he calls a union says i need to cancel the session they said well you're still going to have to pay it's like i don't know how many 20 30 musicians you're still going to have to pay some percentage so he found a demo and made a click track and a guide so he could record the strings even before he re-recorded the track <laughs> Oh my god, that's just a massive yeah. process trying to get everything back after it being stolen. Yeah. Has it was it yeah, ever found yeah. at all? Or did you have to... I don't know how that story ended. I'm sorry, I, don't, I never, you know, I just it was a pretty incredible story at the time, and I don't remember following up how it ever ended. Mm. Okay, carry on. I'm gonna have to get out of here maybe 20 minutes. Let's see what else we can oh, do. Oh, shit, I'll have to get through then. <laughs> get through quick. Um, we'll skip yeah. straight to the the nearing the 40th anniversary of I Wear the Face. That's come quick. Wow. Uh, 
Well, what, what do you want to know about I Wear the Face? We did that actually at that same studio in Westlake uh, oh, like, yeah. with uh, Peter McKeon produced that record. And that was done at Westlake. Uh, yeah. And, uh, oh, what can I tell you? Uh, we started gigging right away. We had a lot of gigs. We were opening for Eurythmics and, and uh, Adam Ant and uh, Madness, different acts. And uh, we were in the studio pretty quickly. Uh, Peter McKeon produced it. Uh, he had me play his drums. He had a drum set that he had used with Min Minute Work. So he wanted me to set up like that, <laughs> which I did. Uh, I was the new guy in the band, so I tried to accommodate. And um, previous, the last couple of five years preceding that, I've been working a lot with Mike Chapman. Mike Chapman, Chin and Chap. Mike produced, well, he produced uh, the Divinals uh, right after that was the Divinals. Uh, but uh, at the time it was Blondie and the Knack and preceding that it was the Sweet and Susie Quattro. Uh, so I've been working a lot with Mike in the studio and his engineer, Peter Coleman. And uh, they have very different technique. They back the microphone. It's a British sound. It's a loud fucking drum sound and the mics are not close and they're not dampened. And then I go in with Peter McKeon to make the Mr. Mr. Record and he dampens everything down. He rearranges the drum set to suit his microphone position. Uh, he wants me to use the heads with the black dots, uh, dead thump, thump, thump. Uh, anyway, it wasn't really my record. <laughs> I'm not, uh, uh, we, a few things we got good. We did the drums on life goes on. We did those out in the loading bay late at night uh maybe a couple overdubs we did but by and large i was pretty disappointed with that record mm. uh so i was really excited when we heard that there was a chance that rca would let us produce ourselves on the next record uh we had a a and r man uh paul atkinson paul atkinson was the guitar player in the zombies and he signed mr mr to rca records and uh and he was the guy who would go to go to bat for us at the label and say okay i think these guys are good i know the record didn't do well but i think they've got it and uh we need to give them another chance and let's you know bring up a budget for them and find a new way to make a record with them and uh, we auditioned we met with several engineers and producers while we were writing uh but we met paul de villiers and he he was the big big change uh, uh paul's a fantastic engineer and South African, and uh, had a lot of musical ideas, very musical guy, and and very, very in tune with drumming. Uh, so I love, love working with Paul. And I was really happy with the uh, sound of that record, Welcome to the Real World. And unfortunately, Richard wasn't that happy with the sound of that record. <laughs> so uh, he had just at that moment actually heard Peter Gabriel. He heard so. So he, he tracked down Kevin Killen, and that's, we made the following record with Kevin Killen, uh, engineer who had worked with Peter Gabriel and U2. Uh, yeah, good friend, Irish kid. Uh, that okay. would be a go on, wouldn't it? 1987. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's Kevin. That That's my favorite from your whole entire catalog. Probably there you a, go. So different. Yeah, different, yeah. different taste. It's probably just for yeah. the song Something Real, because I love the music video. It was made by that guy yeah. who does all that obscure, weird type of styling. Yeah, it's a big Rubczynski. Uh Yeah, I love that video too, actually. And I, and that's one of my favorite tracks we ever did. You're right. Uh, uh, interesting thing about that guy, it's a big, he's he's Polish guy. Do you know anything about him? Uh, he, he, he started to do uh, stop motion animation. Uh, I forget, maybe in the 70s, I don't really know. And uh, and he won an Academy Award. So he came to the United States to receive his Academy Award. It's a fantastic story where he was drinking a lot. He's a heavy. Most Polish people I know are heavy. Drink. I'm going to Poland next month, by the way. A oh, few yeah. weeks. That's was, my that, next was that for Stickman? Yeah. Uh, no, it's Katowice. It's a festival yeah. with uh, ORK. Oh, and okay. we're, my band I do with a couple of Italians and a British guy. And we're opening for Steve Hackett and actually Nicky Mason. Nicky Mason is the, Ooh, how the head great. of that. Yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I've never met him. I don't know that I'll meet him that night. My friend Guy Pratt is playing with him, so maybe I'll have an introduction or something. But uh, uh, what, what, what was I trying to tell you here? Um, it was about the music video. But it was about oh, the guy so who big. made the music he's a big. video. I find this a fascinating story, dude. He's 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 heavily drinking. He goes to the Academy Awards. Uh, 
he's won his Academy Award. They do those presentations in the day, whatever animation or something. I guess he's left it sitting on his seat and he went outside to have a cigarette. And then he tried to go back into the proceedings and the security stopped him. And he's speaking broken English, Polish. He says, no, no, my Oscar is in there. And they're going, no, you're Oscar, you're drunk. Get out of here. So he went to jail. <laughs> the story <laughs> I heard, he went to jail. They, they, had, to, they had to take him away in handcuffs. Um, anyway, quite a quite a interesting character. And he works with his family. It was his wife and brother and, uh, and daughter, I think, were his team. And we did it in New York. New York. I thought it was going to take maybe two days, but he was still making uh, Mick Jagger or Yoko Ono. There's a video he did at the same time, Skating on Ice, one of those videos. So he was running behind. So we had to, the first day or two, we didn't do anything. And then we worked nonstop, 24 hours a day. We didn't leave the studio for like two days, maybe three days. Eventually, Rich had to leave. He had appointments back in L.A., so he had to go. So we shot his footage as much as we could. And then, and then uh, Ferris and Steve George and I stayed to do the extra shots. But basically what Zabig does is he edits in real time. He was doing it on videotape, not, you know, it's got a cheaper look to it. But anyway, he's doing it real time with, uh, he, he uses pieces of cardboard and rulers. And he starts to say, okay, if you stand, you stand here, you duck now. You know, he doesn't speak good English. So he'd say, Rizard, Rizard, Rizard. And he'd tell me, tell Rizard, oh, Richard, he you wants your chin, chin, put your chin up. <laughs> so, you know, it was an interesting session. And uh, yeah, it just grew funnier and funnier because we were uh, sleep deprived <laughs> for the two or three days. So if you watch that video, in some of the reoccurring things, uh, I think you see Ferris start to take his clothes off. I forget what else. He's making a sandwich while he's hanging up. I forget what else. It was just turned into a kind of delirious event. So much stuff. Yeah. I got a friend who is a massive fan of XTC, and I had to spring up with you, working with Andy Partridge, Cole Mording, and uh, Dave Gregory for Dave Oranges Gregor. and Oranges and Lemons in 1989. What was it like working with those three chaps? Well, a super thrill. I'm also a huge fan. I, I happen to think Colin and Andy are, are two of the best songwriters of, of our generation. And uh, so I, I, I'm a big fan. I'd seen them live two or three times. Uh, so I was just shocked when my friend, the uh, same person that produced that last Kenny Loggins, his name is Paul Fox, passed away earlier this year or last year. Uh, and Paul called me. He says, I have another gig for you. We, we, we were buddies. We did a lot of sessions together. He played keyboards. And, uh, and, then, and then he we started to get more sessions and he started to get more production work. So it was very common that Paul would ring me as a friend. Hey, come over. I just need some help. I need a tambourine on this song. Or I need a little, little something here. What do you, or play me something. <laughs> same thing we, think we were just talking about. What do you think of this? And I go, wow, it sounds like it slows down in the chorus. And he goes, yeah, same to me. What's going on? The tempo doesn't change. I said, well, you need an up, you need an accent. Maybe we'll put a hi-hat on the upbeat or a shake or double time or something. It feels like it. So we would do those kind of things together. And then one day he calls and says, I have another gig. And uh, I said, what is it? He says, XTC. And I go, you're lying. That's, that's bullshit. No way. And he says, no, no, I got this gig. They're going to test me. And uh, and uh, so that that's how the gig happened. It was just a thrill of a lifetime. I could I didn't expect it. And uh, and we got to spend uh, a few months together. You know, uh, we had rehearsals for maybe two weeks, uh, two, three weeks of rehearsal. We worked up a lot of material. They had a lot of demos. So we probably 30 songs, I guess, maybe. And then uh, we went into track for... I think we had two weeks to track and we were, we were going at a pace of about a song a day, maybe two songs a day. Mm. Um, so, yeah. So we, and then we did some overdubs. So they were out here and out. Well, not here. I'm not living in LA anymore, but they're out in LA for uh, several months while we made the record. Yeah. I've got the uh, King for a day single. That's my favorite from Orange yeah. and Lemons. Uh, your uh, drumming track on that is great, by the way. Oh, so, thank you. Well, that's uh, that's that's a track that was cut piecemeal, uh, which I've done several things similar to Broken Wings. So that, that bass drum is a machine, and we yep. lay down the machine bass first. We get some guide tracks, and then we start to look for the right snare drum sound. Uh, 
for instance. And, and on a Broken Wings, it was an old slinger and a wooden drum. And we had it out in the room and we found a great position to put the mics in between the two, two wonderful rooms at Oceanway. But on that King for a Day song, uh, I can't remember why, but I made a sample. They, they wanted to hear something. I made a very, I put two or three drums stacked, physically stacked, and, and hit that drum several times. And we took the one that we liked. That's a good sounding drum. And I put it into a sampler. So I actually played the drums on King for a Day from an octopad huh. in the control room. Does that make sense? I'm in the control yes. room yeah. doing just the snare drum as an overdub. And then I would have gone out into the room where the drums were and done the cymbal crashes and top them. So it was, you know what I'm saying? Probably four or five layers of overdubs and some more Lindrum stuff. I did some offbeat like a hi-hat or a shaker and I and I tune I get inside the lindrum you can move the chips around and and there's a couple filters you can change so I, I made them kind of high very knocky knocky sounding which Andy liked he wanted something small kind of small drums on that yes I believe you had that same technique for is it love as well for welcome to the real world yeah yeah very similar uh we did the thing in pieces we lay down the kick drum and a, and a guide track and then start looking what do we really want from the from the snare drum in particular and uh similar situation on that in fact that might be the song that they asked me how i got the sound because i used a regular snare drum and i put a timbali on top of it the timbali doesn't have a bottom head and it's 13 instead of 14 so it just nests right inside there so you've got this thing it stands about you know this this high it's a six inch snare drum with a four inch timbali you can't do that on a drum set <laughs> But if you're doing an overdub, you know, you can put it out in the middle of the room and, and get a big stool, you know. So uh, sometimes we stack three or four drums, uh, a snare drum, a tom-tom, and another drum. And you're hitting the drum on top, but they all rattle and combine. So in particular, Is It Love, I think, is a fantastic snare drum sound. And uh, that's a big part of it. And I doubled it with the Simmons, the SDS-5, the, uh, which I happen to have the, these guys, the old, oh. can you see them down there? Oh my God, no way. I love those, yeah. I love those kits so much. Yeah. I think I've got the samples of them on my yeah. computer. Yeah. That's a lot of the Kyrie sounds. I'll tell you what else we used. I have another piece of gear here. I don't know if you can see it underneath this. It's this Yamaha H, what's that called? Is it turned on? Is it even plugged in? No, it's not plugged in right now. It's a Yamaha uh, reverb that's got a really uh, harsh sound of sound. It was something Paul de Villiers used. And then I found one used on eBay and bought it. I use it now myself here. Uh, so it was, it was a lot of elements combined to make to make that sound. It wasn't, it wasn't just turn it up and play drums. It was like, we're going to spend a couple hours tweaking this in and make a make a snare sound that's really special nice i guess we'll move on to king crimson now since wonder a bit of okay. time <laughs> uh 1994 1995 you joined the band and you get to work with some of the past members including bill bruford who was drummer on most of the 70s record what was it like working with such an iconic name in drumming uh well it's an honor i mean incredible honor uh I I never belong on the same stage with Bill. Bill's I don't know. Bill's a visionary, you know. To me, to me, you know, Bill's Bill's like Ringo. He's he's one of the life the game changing drummers in contemporary music. Uh, so I mean, Bill, I, I put Bill at the highest standard. <laughs> uh, so I'd already been working with Robert, with David Sylvian for six months we'd spent together. So when he called about working with Bill, my first question was, how does Bill feel about this? And, um, and well, to make a long story short, it wasn't Bill's idea. Bill was not too keen on the idea, but I will salute Bill. One thing I, I, I got to say for Bill, when we, when we got going, uh, we jumped in the car together alone one day and I said, Bill, you, you, you don't want me here, do you? And he goes, no. <laughs> and I go, well, you know, you, you can have any drummer. It doesn't have to be me. And I, and I love King Crimson. So maybe I, I should step out and you find a drummer you want to work with. Maybe Bozio, Phil Collins, somebody, somebody you like, or maybe your son, his son, Alex plays drums. And Bill says, no, 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 no. I don't want anyone here. 
it's not about you. So he's he's sort of stuck with me. And if you will, uh, he also said at that time, we were in the car and Robert was getting into another car. And he says, I don't need you. He does. And uh, he pointed at Robert. Yes. So course. Bill and I had a pretty clear understanding from the get go. Uh, I want to let Bill do what Bill does. And I don't want to I don't want to bind him. But I want to be enough of a safety net that Robert is happy and that they don't have all this squabbling. There's a lot of squabbling in that band, <laughs> a lot of talking. <laughs> you know, it's a history. I've read about enough of it to know. Mm. And uh, it, it been a wonderful three years. Bill was great. We learned things from each other. And uh, I obviously learned more than Bill did, I think. But uh, mm. yeah, just 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 I, I couldn't be more fulfilled as, as a musician as a drummer you know yeah the uh dynamic that you bought out the older tracks in the, the 95 to a red and all those tracks that really brought out like your percussive side that you bought with mr mr and when you bought that in finally with king crimson just made it so great and so sonically amazing if you cool will. i'm happy glad it worked you know, you and never then, really, then... you never really know when you're making music. It, 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 you know, you kind of making it for, from my perspective, you're making it for yourself, and you're making it for the musicians around you. And if they're motivated, and we can keep working, and the room feels good, there's good energy in the room. That that that's a score. I'm not usually thinking past that. <laughs> you know, what are the other musicians going to think of it, or something like that? No, yeah. my concern is let's just get through the day here Stanley um, I thought I would let you know that my radio show celebrates its first anniversary today Grooves on the Record oh fantastic happy anniversary what is today the 28th yeah it'll be the 28th here in Australia so yeah I'm trying to think how I will forever remember there's a lot of birthdays uh, in the last couple of days so i'll just try to have to remember you're a few days you're a week after tony levin's birthday and, oh well there you go uh, well he's the sixth so he's actually sixth. three weeks three weeks after. yeah, so yeah pretty go. cool that he turned 60 on six six uh oh six when was it i forget now but anyway there's a lot of sixes in tony's birthday yeah he's a, he's a great bass player as well Absolutely, absolutely geniuses of, of his craft so um, yeah yeah absolutely i love love tony a great great person great player so what was it like working and also as well yeah with missing persons also with with his wife with oh, dale course. and uh warren warren uh i forget warren's name on guitar and and, and patrick o'hearn playing bass yeah. yeah group 87 they were they were called missing persons but missing persons actually originally trying to remember how this happened but i was living in north hollywood then and there was a uh, ken scott there was a studio called the chateau famous engineer producer ken scott worked with the beatles and super tramp and uh, and he was recording group 87 but they they had a budget to record but they didn't have a budget for hotels <laughs> so uh i think it was patrick O'Hearn, uh, Mark Isham, a couple of the guys that were staying at our house while they made the record, sleeping on my couch. And then that band sort of turned into Missing Persons when Dale, his wife, was singing. So, uh, And I saw them several times. They were, they were a great band, really exciting band and, and very visual. You know, not just Dale, but uh, but Terry. He covered his whole drum kit in, in, in Mylar. Uh, different bizarre things. So... Uh, mm. So yeah, I've known Terry, but I haven't ever really hung with Terry. And after the L.A. earthquake, 1994-ish uh, January, we had a big earthquake in L.A. out in the valley where I lived and also where Terry lived. So that was part of the impetus that moved me back here to Austin was, was when I moved in 94. And then I hear from people back in L.A., have you talked to Terry? Terry moved back to Austin. So when I finally do talk, he calls me one day. So I'm like, I don't know, Terry. I'm not going to call and bug the guy. And then one day my phone rings and it's Terry. So what are you doing? I said, well, I'm, I'm in my garage. I'm practicing. I'm trying to learn how to play my bass drum. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so we talk a long time. We start to hang together. And uh, and 
Yeah, we did a show together. We did some recording. Together. We made a record together, which is out again now. They just digitally released it. And that's all percussion. There's no drum yeah, kits on that so record. Yeah, that's so good. Sounds amazing. That's, that's a weird record. We did it in his garage. And the first day we, well, the first couple of times I went to his house, we never played any music. We just talked. And then uh, one day, you know, like I hit a cymbal and he hit a cymbal and I hit a gong twice and he hit it three times. And pretty soon it was music happening. You know what I mean? Just very natural. And uh, he's got a recording system in that room. His Pro Tools or Logic. He turns that on, he records it, but it came out completely distorted, <laughs> overloaded, unusable. So I said, Terry, maybe we should do this again and I'll bring an engineer. I'll bring my buddy. So that's my buddy, Bill Munyon. I've made several records with him. He helps me out on quite a few things. And he came over and we did it like, so Terry's room is just full of drums and gongs and percussion, much like my room and next, oh. next door here. You don't see. Yeah, I'll take, I'll show you a quick picture when we get down here. Uh, so what Bill did, the engineer, Bill Munyon, was he used like a boom, like a long pole with a microphone so he could follow us around the room. And if we got quiet, he could get right in next to these little shakers and record little wood blocks. Or if it was a gong, he know, oh, no, no, back up, back up, back up, you know. So uh, it's an interesting recording that way. It's it's very, the oral is is odd because you hear things slightly moving. And that's why, because the microphone was moving. Uh, yeah. That's great. And we even had a band. We even had a, a short band too in 2004. Uh, but we'll talk about that another day. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's a couple, just, a couple. Sol yeah, there's a lot of things. Yeah, I remember Terry mainly from Danger Money from UK because I'm a massive UK fan. So he's very similar in style as well to Bruford. So that's why I went and probably chose him to replace Bruford, who went to go on and do his own band. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're both very unique. So I, I hate to say Bill and Terry sound similar because i don't think they do at all but at the level they play at absolutely yeah, and the capabilities of, of, yeah yeah mm. there, i do have a question on my own about one mr mr song and that is uniform or youth you have a credit to it okay where did it come from do you at all like what do you remember of it oh well gosh that's i don't think about that song very often well on I Wear the Face, a lot of the material, most of the material had already been written. And when we're doing Welcome to the Real World, um, we we're, we we're writing, like I say, all the time. And the songs that didn't work for us went to other people. And we we're also, besides writing in a small room with drum machines, we also wrote on, we rehearsed. We we're in a, in, a, in a large rehearsal room called Leeds and writing songs. And John Lang would be in the room with us. And that's where Is It Love came out of. So uh -huh. I had some kind of groove going and the guys start to play along and John is up, he, he might pass a lyric, Rich is going la 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 and then suddenly he's going I love you, whatever he's, you know what I mean? It all happens with the five or six of us in a room in, in an hour or two or something. Oh, let's change the bridge. Oh, go down a half step. Oh, let's, hey, what if we change, blah, blah, blah. So it just spins around and then it's like a big jumble and then all of a sudden, hey, we got a song. <laughs> so that's sort of how is it love came together and then it took more shape as we developed and actually at the very end of the recording process it was paul de villiers we had a different bridge the middle eight and paul said you know the, the middle eight sucks he says we really so paul and i and steve george went in the studio with, with paul at osha way at towards the end we said let's let's find a new bridge Comp let's just throw away what we had and start a new bridge and that's that sort of bit we call it spartacus and dun dun and dun dun, ba, dun, dun chong, 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 all that shit with all those so we had a publis on and an ams and we had the drum machine and me and slug and we're just being creative and suddenly we go whoa this sounds exciting you know um so that that was an afterthought so back to uh, uniform of youth i don't really remember i think what happened was i was probably in the room uh there's a double bass pattern in there, right? Do -ga -do -ga -do, do -ga -do -ga -do -ga -do -ga I I was probably trying practicing that or something, and then maybe the guy started to play along with it. I think on the rec well on the record it's a drum machine. I yeah, used, I use a Lindrum, so they're very clean. Uh, but that's sort of how the writing evolution of that started. Uh, in the in the next room over, a year or two later, <laughs> uh, when we were doing the Go On record. Uh, 
I was playing this groove with my Tom Toms, same studio leads, but the rehearsal room, but I'm in a different room. And I had that groove going when Rich walked in and he started. And so he's got that big, we got the Tom pattern thing going. So the song just kind of rolled out. You know what I mean? It wasn't, it wasn't premeditated. It was just, and, yeah. and that, kind of. yeah. So that's a that's a good mix of that within the Mister Mister Band, where we have some songs, Broken Wings, Rich. Over the weekend, we left on Thursday or Friday, came back on Monday. He goes, "Hey, I got this thing." It's like, whoa! So, dome, bomb, a dom, lyric, the bridge. Slug wrote the bridge chords. You know, we all added our little bits to it, but really, Rich, Rich, and John Lang. Yeah. Uh, did that without us anywhere near them so mm. so songs came from different places you know what i'm saying they're, they're, yeah there was a time when we weren't really sure broken wings would even be on the record it, mm. we weren't sure it was a, it, it's you know when you're in the moment you don't know what's a hit i mean you think everything's a hit that's why we're working on it <laughs> and we in those days we were thinking hits you know we need hits we need to be on the radio i've been working with mike chapman i know how mike Mike thinks you got like the acapella Kyrie Eleison ending. That's because I worked with Mike Chapman. I said, guys, radio will love it if we just stop right here, just like hot child in the city and come back in or, or Pat Benatar right then another Mike Chapman, right? She's a heartbreaker, love maker. And then the band comes back in. You know? So I said, man, if you put a couple of these radio guys will love this Kyrie song. Yeah. So it's a big soup, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's trying to find what will work it's, as a single. It's kind of the same deal yeah. as uh, Black White. So this is my Australian copy of Black White. Yeah. I have no idea why it got released as a single if it didn't make any chart progress, but it's a good song. Uh, I like it. Well, that, that's what I'm saying about nobody really knows what a single is. And that Welcome to the Real World, it had 10 songs. And I can tell you, when we were finished with the record, People thought Black White was the single. They thought Run to Her could be the single. Nobody was talking about Broken Wings. Some people thought Kyrie, oh, that's a really strong AOR. You know, they had all these different formats for radio. That's a really good AOR song. Yeah, it is. And, and it, Is It Love was sort of the obvious dance pop single. And then... Uh, our manager, George Giz, who had managed pages and everything, he was approached by Fidel Sassoon, the hair guy, and they wanted to invest in making a video for their hair products. So when they heard Is It Love, they said, great, this will be the band's first single. We'll give you $100,000. It was a big fucking budget to make a video for this song, which we did. That went in the, in the grace the video for Is It Love. Then... In the meetings with the record company, Jose Menendez, who was the president then, the guy that was shot by his kids, was the president of RCA then. And it was Jose, who's Cuban, who says, you know, I, I love that Broken Wings. You think about, um, bah, it's got a little Latin beat, and he's a Latin guy. Yeah. And uh, so in somewhere in this conversation, it was Richard Page, George, I wasn't there, George Giz, Richard Page, Jose Menendez, and some people from the record company that are the the people that that know what radio wants so they're all trying to pick the best song and they're going oh it's it's black white no oh, it's is it love? oh it's this it's that and then it was jose who looked at richard page and said richard what do you think is the best song and richard said broken wings and and jose said that will be our single right so it could have gone any way yeah. you know so and then poor Videl Sassoon, he got fucked because we didn't <laughs> release that video. The record company says, you can't release this. We're going to push the other song. So we got, I think we got $15,000 to go make a video for Broken Wings. That's why it's black and white. And, you know, we didn't have a big budget. Yeah. Uh, and yet it was going to be one of your biggest songs. We're very, very lucky. Very lucky. Yeah. Yeah, Mr. Mr. didn't fare as well on Australian shingles tarts. Only Broken Wings and Kyrie were the hits. Uh, Is It Love did chart, but it was at like the bottom 100 of the Aussie charts. So a real well, shame. Well, it depends, on the, it depends on the country. It was uh, yeah. like top five in America. 
I think it peaked at, at five or six, something like that. And there were other countries where it was higher. It's a yeah. two or three charting song. I can't, you know, there's other countries. I mean, in those days, things were very hodgepodge. You know, it was, uh, you know, now we do it all with the internet. <laughs> but it, it, Mr. Mr. The Band, we never played in Europe. We went to Europe to do a promotion tour to set up the tour. So when we went over there, all we did was TV shows. We did lip sync in every freaking country because every country is different. They got, there's MTV Belgium, there's MTV Holland, there's MTV UK, there's MTV France, there's MTV Germany. So everybody had to have us do their show. Yes. And their Johnny Carson show and their Good Morning America and all yeah. the equivalents. So we spent the freaking month over there every country shaking everybody's hands and saying hey we're coming back we're going to do a tour this summer and then we never did a tour yeah. we never came back to Europe because the record we did our success went down it, it tapered so i'm guessing and everybody assumed oh, okay you know you, you assume when the next record comes out yeah. we'll go back up yeah. and then we'll do all these things but it never happened mm -hmm. i'm guessing why that was one of for australia as well that same reason promotional tour never happened well, we did shows there. At least we did shows oh. in Australia. We, oh, yeah, we did... that's true. Someone did mention that. One yeah, yeah, we like came one... down. We Sorry? did three, two or three shows. We did. Uh, we came down because we could also go to Japan, where we did live shows. So it's part. Of, that's always like King Crimson has never played in Australia. We can never connect the dots. It's too expensive, yeah. you know. So you you can't play here unless you're there. <laughs> so. Uh, we came down to do Molly Melbourne's uh, countdown, yes. some kind of big show. It was a huge stadium, maybe 20,000 people indoor. Uh, it was staying in excess, but I believe you were lip syncing like a stadium gig, but we had to play the backing track. Richard would sing live, but, but the track is there's no production, no sound checks or anything. Mm. And then we played additional. I think we played two live shows in Sydney and, and Melbourne. Yeah, I think we played two live shows. Funny enough, I saw a, uh, I guess it's a TikTok thing. Yeah. And they were going, they were going along the beach. I don't know what beach it was, but they're asking people of the capital of Australia, and nobody got it. I felt so because I played in Canada. I know, and I've played there. So I, I go, come on, come on. But it, the guy's going down the beach. He asked like thirty people. You know, everybody's Sydney. A couple guys are Melbourne. One guy says Perth. One guy says Auckland. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, we Americans are not known for our geography, uh, our sense of the world. We're, we're the middle of the world. And in America, you think it's all, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I'm very lucky we got to play in Australia. And I wish King Crimson had got to play down there. I, I wish ORK could play down there. It's just like more prog in general. I mean, we had Steve Hackett. I actually luckily got to meet Steve Hackett when he last came here. Very nice guy. Got to interview him as well. Totally so, great, man. I got to say, I, I work with this uh, Japanese Guitar Wars. And I was the drummer for, for the house band, which was Steve Hackett, John Paul Jones, Nuno Bedett Court, Paul Gilbert, m maybe a couple others. So it was a pretty intense couple days. And, uh, I remember I took a break with Steve Hackett. We walked around a Japanese graveyard together talking oh, about life. <laughs> uh, but but he is is very encouraging. Steve is a very encouraging guy to me. Yeah. yeah. He signed my copy of Highly Strong. So that's obviously my favorite record from 1983. And uh, he actually played Camino Royale on his return trip back to the UK. So he must have thought of me because that's my favorite song from him. Oh, Oh, it's just a coincidence. I don't know. <laughs> I also do love okay, your kids. Dude. Oh, that's it. Yeah. Okay. So I'll give you the quick tour here, dude, because I've got you online and you're a drummer. Uh, let's see. I'm backwards here, so it's hard for me to see what I'm actually showing you. But this is my control room. Yeah. I, I use mostly Pro Pro Tools, and I have this API desk, a nice for my drumming. Uh, can you see there? I don't know if my finger's in front of the camera. Yeah, your finger's in front of the camera. There we go. There Something you know. like that, and but but I don't I don't have any control room. Oh, there's just, your this is, the old, this is this is the bedroom, and then ah. you just go through a door. There's no glass into this room here, which is uh, which is full of my drum shit. Whoa, 
so when I say it's kind of like Terry's, like Terry would have yeah. had all these gongs hanging on the wall. Yeah. But, uh, I've got a lot of old drums here. It's a nice microphone. It's an 87 or SM2 and uh, I'm guessing a lot of all, your, and... all your bits and bobs from King Crimson, all your toys. Yeah, yeah, a lot of that, old old souvenirs and drum heads. And, and then uh, you might remember Jude Cole. Do you remember Jude Cole, an artist in the... Uh, in the 80s that I played a couple of records with. So I've been doing Jude Cole's record. So that's my drum kit right now. Oh, uh, yeah. Old brass or, or bronze uh, Ludwig, but a nice DW kit I have. And uh, yeah. Cool. That's kind of what I'm doing. Yeah. So uh, I'm simultaneously, I'm doing Jude Cole's record right now, a couple tracks for his upcoming, I don't know if it would be a record or what it will be. And simultaneously, um, Marcus Reuter, who I play with at Stickman, a couple of German touch guitarists, and Trey Gunn. Trey was in Crimson. Yes. The three of us, we're, we're starting a trio. We have started a trio, and we'll call it Tuner, T-U-N-E-R. And uh, we'll do some gigs on the in USA uh, the, the end of August, September. And then we have, oops, what did I do there? Then we have another, we have some European dates in November. I don't know where my camera i never know where it is on the thing it's somewhere anyway so i've been yeah so uh yeah quite an extensive list uh trey and marcus were here last week and uh we recorded I'm gonna snooze here nice see that. i i see it oh, they're, 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 trans europe they're, express <laughs> nice choice yeah. there's about yeah those are pieces that we're gonna sculpt uh a record out of and then we also worked on about 15 pieces that will play live we're going to play larks for construction of light things like that that haven't been played very much uh by anyone other than crimson so yeah. been a while so cool so a lot uh, of homework are your simon pads still with you the uh originals because a... you know they're pretty iconic one more time uh your simon your simmons pads that go with the module yeah what about it? Oh, uh, the pads? Are they, Do I have are the they pads? Still, are, yeah, are they still with you at all? Or like, were they in the drum room? Yeah. Uh, no, they're in this other little room. Uh, I made a record with my wife during COVID that we called A Romantic's Guide to King Crimson. So that was right when I converted the studio. My wife had her hip replaced. And uh. the bedroom was up here where my studio is. So we said it's not good to be going up and down the stairs. So we converted to a bedroom downstairs. And I took the upstairs as a studio. And this this was our closet here. I'm going heading to now the other side of the room. And this is now kind of a storage place. I don't know if you can see any of that. But more shit. More and more shit. This would be like my insurance. Any, you're asking about the Simmons. Yeah. I think they're... they are. I think they're, if I dig a little harder, see, there's some feed drum pads. Yeah, there's the V's. There's the old that wind would, drum. That would be from. There's a wave drum. The V drums, I think so... they would be construction of light era. If. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, uh, I forget where it is, the brain. It, it was this one. It was this. Construction of light was that generation. Yeah. And then later. It was this generation. Mm. And I've, unfortunately, I've lost all the memory. I lost all the sounds. I thought I'd have them forever, but the uh, the batteries die and then the memory card dies. And so all the sounds I had saved from those things are gone. Uh, yeah. If you, can't, if you can't find them today, you can always just send me pictures on the email. Either way. <clears throat> yeah, I'm going to try and get back to work now. Yeah, good idea. Get, good idea. Well, uh, okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, very you're informative about all these bands, and um, yeah. Hopefully, you can uh send us off off to, off to the socials. You can check it out, and uh, yeah. Hope you had a great time being interviewed by some random twenty one year old Australian who knows a lot about old music. Oh, thanks for your enthusiasm. It's nice to know there's ears. People are listening. Yes, indeed. Okay.